Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, next year for our, let's see, our Education Impact Day 2016. This is our first attempt at doing a 12-hour webcast-a-thon, and we are so appreciative of all of our guests who've joined us. And today we have um, Lisa Petridis, and I am pronouncing, am I pronouncing that correctly? Absolutely, yes, okay. Petridis. Yes. I wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, mispronouncing. And we are so excited um, to have her joining us for multiple reasons. For one, she has done some amazing things um, in the field of education. And from a very personal standpoint, she, the, her organization has been very supportive of our work. And we, we use her platforms um, in many different capacities in the projects we work on in creating open educational resources for adult education. Um, so with that, um, Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself and just give us a little bit of background um, about uh, ISKME as well as yourself in general? Great. And uh, in terms of the format, I, I guess my style is to maybe say less. And if you want to keep prompting me for questions, I'm happy to, uh, you know, to to continue to explain something. So um, so thank you very much, Jennifer. So glad to be here this morning. And when I, um, we talk about the virtual worlds, when I first got your invitation, I, I said, oh, darn, I'm going to be on a flight that day to Paris. I can't make it. And then when I realized, in fact, that we could do it as, as a webinar, I said, this is, this is the world that I live in, and I'm glad, I'm glad of it. So I'm um, just delighted to be here. And um, uh, a little bit about me, just briefly, um, I mentioned uh, before, started out uh, my work really as a researcher, and um, that's what I was trained to do, a social science researcher. I, I mentioned Dan Hickey. We were postdocs many years ago um, at Educational Testing Service and went on to uh, be on the faculty at Columbia University at Teachers College. And I was brought on there to run a really interesting program. When you think about 1997 and what was going on in education then, uh, almost 20 years ago, I was running a program where you could get your EDD from the School of Education and an MBA from the business school. And a lot of the classes I was teaching were things that had to do with um, information and decision making and information systems. This was a lot of the beginning of, you know, using uh, technology around the sharing and use of data and information. I think we still had about 15 search engines back then and uh, uh, left there to actually found ISKME, which is the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management in Education, uh, which I did back in 2002, 2003. And um, we've been going full, full forces ever since. Um, I would say that uh, while I loved teaching and I loved being in the university environment, I was kind of a bit of a restless um, academic in that I really wanted to see uh, the work that we were doing, the theories we were writing about, I really wanted to see them in practice. And um, I decided to, that I wanted to try to take this work that I was doing there as a, as a faculty member and put it into practice in the outside world, continuing to do the research that we had been doing, but actually have it be very applied uh, and really try to kind of stay at the, you know, kind of at the cutting edge of, uh, you know, pushing ahead innovation as, as we saw it. Um, back then, uh, when we started ISKME 14 years ago, People weren't talking a lot about uh, the use of information and decision making. Um, now it seems commonplace. So really kind of moving, uh, taking that work and, and moving it forward and, and moving it uh, right onto the ground, I think has propelled it uh, further than, um, you know, than probably I could have been able to do in, in the more traditional academic environment. But we have a lot of connections with, you know, the research worlds because we have a research team. We, I, we have three different teams. I'm sorry, I'm going to say one more thing. We're, we have three teams that work cr across, um, across uh, the team. Uh, one is our research group, and then we have our training and design group, and then we have our, um, basically our open education group, which is building um, all of these great resources, which I'll tell you about, our public digital library for open education and other things, other kind of communities of practice that involve sharing and collaboration. 
And uh, I think one thing you just mentioned, I'd really love to kick us off on. I'm so excited to have you here for something you just mentioned. Uh, we, we hear a lot about um, the entrepreneurial, the need for entrepreneurship within education. And who better to talk about that than you, both the opportunities <laughs> as well as the challenges, as I'm finding myself uh, trying to, to get my own nonprofit off the ground. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? And, and again, our theme for this entire session is about how can you make an impact? And um, if you could give us a sense of what it's like to be an entrepreneur mm. when you're venturing out in this, as you said, world of fairly traditional roles for uh, for where you can fit in and, and, and give value. And you, you've certainly created your own path. Can you speak to that? <laughs> yeah, that's, thank you for that question. Um, it's funny because I don't think 20 years ago I considered myself an entrepreneur. And in fact, I, I think it wasn't until seven or eight years ago when people were saying, no, you're a social entrepreneur. You know, this language became much more commonplace. And then as I looked at the definition of those things, I said, okay, I guess it is what we're doing. I guess we are, I guess we are being entrepreneurial. But in some ways, you know, I'm going to sort of dissect the word for a moment because, of course, we know what an entrepreneur is in business and it means starting out and having an idea and, um, and really trying to put it into practice. It means taking enormous risk uh, for something that you have no idea is actually going to work or not. Um, certainly, I know when I left my academic job, I had lots of people tell me I'd never work again, and I, it was the biggest mistake I'd ever made. Um, and I think entrepreneurs hear that a lot. Um, they hear, uh, we don't do it that way. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, there's no precedent for that. Uh, and of course, in the education field, you know, people say, well, there'll they'll never be any money for that. It's going to be hard to make a go of it. So in some ways, being an entrepreneur is about being able to kind of shut off those sort of voices in the background that say that and just saying here's the idea and we're going to work on it and we're going to iterate on it and i think a very important part of it though is is that no entrepreneur works in a silo at least not the successful ones and i think that we're still here 14 years later sort of points to the fact that you know we've had some amount of success certainly and, and what the important piece is when you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea and you want to implement it on the ground, really what that means is you are, have to become a very good listener as an organization. Um, you have to really take sort of the empathy piece of what we know in good design thinking and apply it uh, and, and really be thinking about who you're serving and how you're serving um, the change that you're trying to make. So um, that's just kind of an overall picture of kind of what I what I think it means to be an entrepreneur. Um, in some ways, you know, I, I laugh, especially when I talk to my, uh, you know, my good friends and colleagues who are still in academia. I do a lot of the same kind of things still. Um, I, um, I mentor young people. Um, I give talks. I do research. Uh, I have a great team of people who are um, creatively thinking about new ways to serve the field of open education practice. And so it's still sort of shepherding a lot of new ideas and thought. It's just doing it in a way that sort of has um, less constraints, uh, more risks, and, um, and a little bit less of a, of a map to follow. Uh, yeah, and uh, something I definitely want to tie into your conversation. You founded a nonprofit and relied, um, and I'm reading from your bio, you can definitely fill in the blanks and correct me, but um, like, for example, OER Commons was grant funded, right, Went to, to kick it off. And in our last conversation, we talked to Bob Russell from National Science Foundation, this whole idea of sustainability, you know, getting a, a grant to get something off the ground is one thing, but what do you do when that's done and you're now a nonprofit? <laughs> you know, especially so, like, for example, Designers for Learning, serving a population that is, the reason we're serving them is they don't have funds uh, and they, they run into those issues. So. How does that play into you as running this this entity as a business? The the fact that um, you you're you're purposely targeting important social causes that may or may not have uh, the ability to help you fund your your and sustain your what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, and and certainly I think the nonprofit world is um, experiencing this as, as a field. Certainly, um, not just in this country, but internationally as well with NGOs. You know what's um, so what's really interesting is, of course, I think the traditional nonprofit and many nonprofits are still in this way. In fact, I would say most nonprofits are still in this way that 
the majority of their funding, you know, 75, 80, Five percent uh, is from philanthropic sources, either from foundations or donations. And what we've really seen the shift around sustainability overall, and I think foundations are really uh, interested in this as well as, uh, as is any donor or contributor, you want to give money that you hope is actually going to take something and help it maintain. So once you walk away for, with your, from your money, you know, how can this go? Or, or is it we just propping it up and letting it go and it always has to be that way? And I think that's been the critique of nonprofits in the, in the last five years. So, um, you know, I would say ISKME has really responded to that um, as an organization and with our board. And about four years ago, we made a very deliberate strategic shift to move from an organization that was very traditional in the sense of our funding structure. We got about 85% of our funding um, from philanthrop philanthropically, and that's uh, grants from foundations, government, donations. And what we decided to do is to really look at we already were providing a lot of services from our grants. We were serving schools, we were serving higher education institutions, we, we were um, serving non-formal education environments like, like, like your own, Jennifer. And so we realized that if we were uh, very strategic about that, we could be charging for our services, just like you would, um, you know, before the, the, the foundation paid for it, but now we could go and say, we know you want to do this, you know, and I can, I'll talk more about what our work actually is, um, but we can say, you know, what we create is publicly available, it's open, you know, openly licensed, um, anybody can use it. But if you as an organization or an entity would like some assistance in either on the professional learning side of it or on some of the other kinds of library creation services we do, um, we, you know, we fund ourselves that way. And today, we are, we have a great um, balance. We're about 50% funded by our services and 50% funded by um, philanthropic. Yeah, that's, that's the magic, uh, the formula, right? It's just trying to figure out, figure that out. And that's what we're learning very uh, quickly. <laughs> trying, it's one thing to, and, and this is a great comment Anthony posted, um, pursue your pur purpose with a passion. And that's, so true and we what we found it hasn't been hard to get people behind our passion um, but from from the business side of state things and keeping the lights on it's we're a new nonprofit and it's it's great to be able to speak with you about this and then okay. and follow from your example and and that's probably also a good segue to talk a little bit about OER Commons uh, because I think that's probably an area where you do blend um, giving things away for free right uh, to the to the greater good and then also figuring out a way to um, to sustain, sustain your organization. So can you, I'm sure most people who are on here know all about OER Commons, but would, <laughs> would you mind giving us a little bit of the history and then and also your plans for it in general? Sure, yeah, and I wanted just to address a little bit about what you said, the, um, it's really interesting doing this work in open education today where there are in fact uh, a lot of new players. Um, we've been in it from the very beginning, 10 years ago plus and there's a lot of players in it today uh, just a lot of great people doing work making use of open education resources creating um, OER um, uh, you know building platforms you know all the, all these kinds of things that really are helping the field um, and that means that there's also a lot of for-profit interest as well as a lot of nonprofit interest and what I think I'm really proudest of so far in, in our work is that we've always managed to really take um, the mission um, oriented, you know, the mission driven piece of who we are, which is also driven a lot and informed by our passion for access and equity for access to, you know, education for all. And um, kind of keep that first and foremost. And I think with every new uh, initiative or project that we become involved in, we really do take that barometer and say, is this, is this aligned with our mission? Um, and, and I think we, in some ways it's a luxury as a nonprofit to be able to do that. Uh, it also can give you a lot of, um, you know, indigestion and heartburn. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, on the other hand, we see a lot of for-profits in education come and go. You know, I think one out of 10 actually is still standing 18 months after it starts. So there's a certain longevity that being um, sort of very mission driven can bring you. Um, but it is a different sort of sort of mindset in that way. And like I said, every decision that we need to make isn't about what kind of return do we need to make on our investment. It's what kind of return do we need to make on our mission. 
And so far, I think we've really been, you know, we've worked hard and we're fortunate and had good timing that, you know, we have never had to really waver from that. And I don't intend to. Yeah. You know, and um, I don't want to make this a story about me, but just to tie into what it's like, because we're kind of on different ends of the spectrum. You're, you, you're a successful uh, nonprofit and we're just starting, but I'm finding that a lot. I get a lot of calls, you know, we get a little bit of notoriety and then it's very easy for someone to kind of take our idea and want us to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's been a very difficult balance uh, trying to, in, in the statement you just made, you know, just be, be true to your mission uh, because there are a lot of different ways we could take things and um, that, that's, you don't realize it. I don't want to say you become a victim of your success, but the success That's brings big. different opportunities and yes. um, it, you just have to try to determine with your board. Um, and that's another thing as well with a board. This isn't just the world according to, to Jennifer. Now we have a board right. and we <laughs> talk these right. things through. And so I think that's important yeah. for our li listeners and for viewers that are um, participating today in, in this whole idea of, um, is this something I'd like to try is when you start a nonprofit and um, it isn't the world according to you anymore. <laughs> it's really the, the world according to your organization. So thank you for adding that. You're welcome. And, and, and that's what makes what, the work you do stronger um, because it isn't just about you, the person, um, the solo, you know, entrepreneur. It's really about you and the organization and your mission. And if you like to wake up every morning realizing that you're doing something that is really mission driven in that way, it's a, it, it's a great feeling in it. And it certainly makes up for all of the all of the risk that you take and the uncertainty along the way. But um, let me talk about um, open education resources and just um, without really without being able to see quickly a raise of hands of who know who's heard the term OER. I think, um, you know, five years ago when I told my former academic colleagues that I was, you know, heavy into this space of open education, they all kind of looked at me and were like, hmm, whatever, okay, I guess that's good. And uh, what we've seen five years later is just um, such a terrific uh, widespread, um, not only adoption of open education resources, but a real adoption of sort of the principles of what they mean. And, uh, and I'll explain a little bit too of kind of what that means also in the education technology field. Um, you know, because we've had, let me just diverge for a minute from OER that, you know, you know, early on we had all of our education technology work, all of our ed tech work, well, the majority of it came external to the education field. It was people developing things that came into the education space and said, here's the way to do it, right, and here, here's, here's our product, buy our product, or no, buy our product is better, and it will enable you to do X, Y, or Z. I think with open education resources, we've been able to really start from a completely different space, which is internally, what are the needs within education? Now, some of the, the needs, I mean, affordability, uh, we've see, certainly seen that's been sort of the, the, uh, the, um, the lightning rod for open education resources, which of course in, in part was um, a result of uh, enormous um, uh, increases in the cost of textbooks. Uh, we saw early on, you know, studies that showed, for example, in the community college that textbooks were 75% uh, of the cost of a student going to community college. Uh, so we knew that uh, affordability was a huge issue and, and still continues to be. I think just the K-12 alone, the market just for textbooks, it's, it's hard to get the exact number, but it's, you know, somewhere six to eight billion dollars a year, every, every year here in the U.S. And that doesn't include, that's not higher ed, and that doesn't include all the supplemental kind of resources. And I say that to say, that's a big investment. Uh, and, you know, how might we, as a person who's worked a lot in education policy, how might we look at that uh, allocation of those kinds of funds and what they really could be doing to make the field itself uh, sustaining and really kind of support the whole ecosystem of education and not just, you know, certain, um, commercial entities. So that's been a, a real important, exciting part of, of OER. On our end, uh, we've been so much more focused on the real impact, um, the deeper learning, how you teach differently in a digital world. Um, if you just simply create a resource that is freely uh, and openly licensed, and I could talk a little bit about that, uh, perhaps Jennifer later, uh, around things like Creative Commons that make it an easy way to uh, license material. 
But if you just simply take a free something that's free and replace it with something that that costs, uh, you know, $150, and you still teach in the same way, you really haven't moved the needle on transforming teaching and learning. And really, OER, as we see it, is something that is catalyzing. Um, things that many people have known for a long time, but that I don't think we've had widespread acceptance for. So early on with technology, I remember in the early uh, distance learning courses, you know, you'd you'd go down a hall and you'd see somebody, you know, sitting in front of a screen, kind of like we're doing right now, uh, you know, simply uh, lecturing, right, and not really engaging in a different kind of way. And what open education resources, the use, the practice, and this is really what we've moved to. We, we really talk about open education practice. It's about how uh, teachers, faculty, let's talk about teachers specifically for a moment, how they're really engaged in the, in the pedagogy and the content itself, how they're part of the process of, of um, th they're really the ones who know the best how content needs to be adapted and personalized to their own classrooms. And that's something that is just so phenomenally possible in the open education space. And this is where we're really starting to see the differences, not to mention the student participation piece of OER. There's whole courses that have been de developed um, between teachers and their students around bringing different kinds of resources into read and then adapting them and then doing things like aligning them to standards and, and reviewing them and evaluating them and figuring out how to continuously improve them. So really an open education practice is one that is about openness, it's about collaboration and sharing, and it's about continuous improvement. And um, those are sort of all theoretical con constructs in a way, but those are really the underpinnings of, of what OER is today. So 10 years ago, we got our first grant from uh, the Hewlett Foundation to work on open education resources. They basically said, could you go out and tell us who's, who's creating them and what subjects are they? And, you know, and, and, and let us know, uh, you know, how it's working. And, um, you know, we kind of joked that we came back to the Hewlett Foundation with a big, huge Excel spreadsheet with a thousand rows with lots of what became metadata, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of columns of, of description about the content itself. And we, you know, gave it to our program officer who said, like, I, I can't, I, this is too much. I can't look at this whole sheet. Give it to me in a way that makes sense. Uh, and so the whole sense making of, of information and data is how our digital public library was born, OER Commons, and maybe somebody could just throw that in the chat screen, um, oercommons.org. And really what OER Commons is, is it is a digital public library of open education resources that has also with it uh, a collaboration platform that you can author content, uh, remix content, group content, create collections, um, that's at, at, at the core what OER Commons is. Um, we do a lot of, we have full-time digital librarians who do a lot of work around the metadata and the information science behind OER, uh, behind o the OER resources, um, as well as a training and design team who does a lot of professional learning and workshops around how you engage uh, faculty and teachers around in, in this whole process of, of open education. Um, I guess at, at the core, that's really what OER Commons is. Oh, one other thing is that we also um, create, there's also spaces that can be created. Anybody can go in, and I think, Jennifer, you've been very forward uh, moving in that regard. You can, anybody can go in today and make a group and create a place where your open education collection is, uh, whether it's a course, in a MOOC, or, or something else, you know, a subject-specific group of teachers who are trying to improve their math curriculum in their district. All of that, it is just like a public library. You walk in the door, you take what you want. Um, but we also offer the ability to do, to create your own communities of practice. And this is what we use hubs for on OER Commons. Um, this is a service we provide. If you want to create your own community of practice that has workflow embedded in your own, um, your own kind of rubrics and evaluation tools, um, that's the kind of things that our people do on, on the back end. And the last thing uh, that we do is, um, and, and this is also part of our move to sustainability, is we actually now, uh, OER Commons is really an engine that can run this, this public library and collaboration platform. And we uh, take OER, there's many sites out there today that are doing this work, 
that are white labeled, it's really OER Commons on the back end. Um, you know, like the Intel inside chip on your on your computer. Uh, it's you know OER Commons on the inside, but it's completely white labeled with its own its own work. And we've done this. Um, all over the country. Uh, you might know the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. We, we, are, we are their Atlas platform. Uh, we've also created uh, for the Ministry of Education in Saudi Arabia a whole microsite that is both um, English and Arabic for um, their schools and universities. So the work is just so exciting because it continues to be um, uh, a you know, adopted just across across the world, and I think as more people are understanding that you know that free is good, and, and that really impacts affordability. In fact, this cost to um, educating your you know your faculty and your teachers, and so it's not like everything is just free, but it provides this mechanism and this conduit where collaboration and sharing around content can be can be done. And I, I definitely, there's so many things that you've said, and I'm kind of keeping my eye on the text chat as well, but um, I totally remember 10 years ago with the discussions of do we need repositories or can't we just tag everything <laughs> in our resources and let Google be our repository. And uh, so that, you know, clearly the repository is one aspect of when I think of OER Commons, but it, it to me also it's the authoring piece of it, which ties into your comments of, empowering the educator or um, even to you I love your point to the student um, to come up with the resources that can be created not just a matter of storing and sharing but then the creation aspect of it so do, would you mind talking a little bit about your creation tools I know there's certainly open author that we use and we use it because it's a little bit more for in at least in our perspective a little bit more teacher facing mm -hmm. and I know that there's a couple now tools that you're working on that are um, for online learning would be more what I would consider to be learner facing would you would you mind sharing a little bit about those? Yeah, absolutely. And um, of course, uh, we are always willing to do follow-up conversations and demos. We have our own webinars. Um, I think they're every other month where we feature some aspect of OER Commons. So uh, if you're interested, you can contact me and I'll make sure that you get, get on those um, mailing lists. In fact, Jennifer, if you could go ahead and put my email address too into the chat screen, that would be great. Um, we create started creating authoring tools about four years ago. Early on, Really, um, our library was mostly, um, you know, indexing content that was in other platforms, and we would work with, with um, educators, and you know, we'd say, well, go put your co content here on this, you know, in in the wiki or your Ning or in connections. There were many platforms to do that, but what we realized over time is there wasn't anything that was just so simple, intuitive, really user facing that you could not only create the content, but um, we have great version tracking. And so if we're really thinking about how we build on each other's work, it's very important to have the content, you know, in a platform that is uh, very portable. And this is the other really important piece, I think, about OER Commons that we've done over time. So there's uh, content tools just to create simple, simple modules. There's also tools now that are a little bit more higher ed facing, more kind of, um, you know, how do you create um, a whole course, and then there's also um, some tools that are a little bit more K-12 facing. So we've sort of, um, some of that is just about language and how you think about it, um, but some of it also is sort of conceptually, you know, what you need in, in that kind of platform. So uh, we're creating new tools every day. This has become a much more important part of what we do. And another important piece is that, you know, in the spirit of what is the ecosystem and how do we serve it, um, all of our content, so if you create a, a course and you want to bring it into your own platform, we have, for the for the technical people on, uh, here on the call, uh, we have LTI integrations, we're integrated with Google Classroom, with Clever. We look for every opportunity to integrate with other systems because today, kind of the successful exchange of knowledge isn't about being the kingdom, the one place where everybody goes. It's about how do you have what you have and how do you, you know, package it in a way such that it can travel where it needs to go to serve, uh, to serve the learner. Uh, and so that's a very important part of our work. Um, I want to, can I say one, I, I want to say something about Big Ideas Fest, but uh, yes. Did you, because that's, that's coming please up. Do. I, see. I, def, I yeah. have that as my, um, uh, on, on my question list. So yeah, please go ahead. Talk. Okay, right great. Up. Well, what, yeah, and what I wanted to say is, so when you think about this work in open education, I mean, we kind of went a little bit into the, you know, into the details of it, 
But really what it was, was being, you know, just being innovative and thinking about, you know, what the end user need is and what are we trying to transform in education. And we use a lot of design thinking in our own work, both in our own um, development work as well as in our own professional uh, training work that we do. And uh, eight years ago, we um, took all of that and we kind of packaged it in a way and we turned it into this event called Big Ideas Fest. And it happens typically the first week in December. Uh, this year, it's happening December 4th through the 7th. Uh, and it's in San Jose, California, just south of San Francisco. It's a very intense, immersive kind of three days of how we, not only how do we celebrate sort of the amazing innovation work that we see across uh, the country and all over the world, but it's really about how do we innovate, you know, how do we build the capacity of educators to innovate where they are. It doesn't always have to be the outside coming in with something. It's not always some shiny, new, expensive thing that you got a couple million dollars to build. Uh, some of the most amazing innovations happen by, you know, people working with uh, cardboard boxes. If you know Kane's Arcade, uh, who was a speaker we had several years ago. So innovation, we really look hard to find these kind of very unique kind of cutting edge innovations. And those are our speakers. But then we have a very immersive um, sort of cohort model where we um, do design thinking around a design challenge. Uh, and uh, work through that. So we're both really addressing an issue that has some impact as well as helping to build the capacity of educators to sort of really learn the skill and approach around design thinking. And this year, our, our theme, which I think is very timely, uh, is called um, Educating to be Human. And the concept is, if we really think about education and what it's serving, what does it mean to educate to be human? And are we doing that? And how do we how do we really uh, weave that into innovation instead of having innovation over here on one side and, and, you know, social emotional learning and conflict resolution and these kinds of things on the other. Those are, those are two today. They're kind of two separate, separate fields. If we actually kind of brought them together and said, what does it mean to do that as we're creating education technology, as we're creating new practice. Um, so that's what we're doing this year. And we're really excited. And it's obviously been a very intense year for the country. Uh, and we think that we're going to, um, it's going to be an amazing year. We've got some great speakers and that's bigideasfest.org. So, yeah, we put that in the, the chat room. That That's very exciting. And you're, I'm assuming then because you're plugging it, you're still taking applicator uh, uh, registration. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And there are some scholarships available too. Uh, that, so, would be pretty, that would be pretty yeah. mean if you plugged it and then, oh, I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry yeah. though. It's closed. It's yeah, closed. yeah, no, 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 no. It's very much, it's very much open and we've got a great crew and, uh, it's going to just be a terrific event this year. Well, I know you literally have to fly, and then I just <laughs> like <laughs> we do have a couple questions. I'll throw them at you. I, I'd questions. love to. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm ninety percent packed. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if nothing else, you know, just bring a toothbrush and you'll be fine. Passport, um, computer, and the, and the charger. What do you need? What else? And your cell phone. <laughs> So in the Q&A section, um, I think this is a great question. Teresa uh, mentions um, the, the idea you do have the hubs and the groups. And so the, this idea of like taking your resources and bundling it in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, but how does that, um, how, what are your thoughts on doing it that way versus thinking of it in terms of more of a national re repository, this idea that if we really want to share, we're kind of, are we putting up barriers across? And I'm kind of adding to her question. Uh, she was specifically saying, do you feel each state should create their own repository or should we have a national repository, but I'm kind of taking it even that next step further. Um, when we do start breaking things into groups and hubs and things, does that um, in any way potentially limit the reach? Any thoughts on that? That's, yeah, that's a great question and something that we've thought a lot about. Um, you know, some of you might know about the Go Open initiative, which was sort of a Department of Ed uh, enthused uh, idea for states to be to make a commitment to open education resources and uh, one of the things they said is to become a go open state you need your own repository and we actually you know spend a lot of time we are a go open approved repository library we call ourselves a library not a repository um, and what we what we went and said to them is we said if a group makes their own hub in OER Commons and actually has all the resources there 
isn't that in fact, a, you know, does that suffice? And they looked at it all, and they said, of course it does, right? So this idea that we all have to go out and recreate the wheel, I mean, the truth is that OER Commons is a very mature software platform that's had, you know, a few million dollars of investment in it over time from several different foundations. So the idea that we would sort of start from scratch, from state to state, I guess if you really have the resources and you're really technically inclined and you, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's just that I don't think it's necessary. It's not really necessary. Now, <laughs> in terms of groups and, and hubs, I mean, the way that OER Commons, the way our library is configured is that, and of course, this is all digital. So if you go in a, in a print library today, right, um, a beautiful traditional public library, if you go in there, there's sections and there's books all over the library. And so if you want to go look at botany, you go over here. And if you want to go look at women's studies, you go over here. So we have the same thing in OER Commons, right? And you might even say, oh, well, we're North Carolina. We have all our resources in this room. But the beauty of it, of, of digital, is that you, you know, all the resources are there on the back end. And it's really how you curate them and put them together in your own room. So the beauty of having them in um, a public digital library, and I like to think that OER Commons is really the OER public library of record. Um, no matter, as long as it's there, anybody who wants to make a group or a room can put it in there, but it doesn't, it doesn't prevent it from being somewhere else. And in fact, it's a, in fact, it's a really good organizing principle. Often we'll work with a state and they'll say, you know, oh, well, well, we're, our state is so unique. We have nothing in common with that, you know, with those other states. And we say, great, here's your space. And then they say, oh, what did Hawaii do? Oh, what has Minnesota done? What has North Carolina done? And I, and I think it's just natural to say, to be kind of fiercely independent about what we do and say we do it our way. But then we, we've kind of created this way to, uh, kind of uh, trick people into collaborating because, and we don't trick them, but they see that this is the North <laughs> Carolina collection. You know, they say, oh, what have others done? And I think that's so much of, you know, when you don't know or you're unaware of how that, what, what is really there, you don't know how to share and collaborate. But if you have it and you organize it and you curate it with a lot of intention, so it's not just a big old Google search where everything in the, in the kitchen sink is there, uh, if you really have a good librarians who that's their job to know, you know, from an information science perspective, how to create content, you know, that's, that's the value. Is yeah, that, that yeah. the question? Totally. And then there's a second question that was, that came up earlier that I'm going to try to make an attempt to tie in with this. Um, Sullivan asked the question to address um, the alignment with, with standards, which I think gets to this as well. Um, and especially when you think in the United States, well, I don't know where we're going now with Common Core. That will be interesting. Um, so uh, from, from the kind of the backroom perspective from you at, at, at OER Commons, um, how do you, what, what is your thought process on having uh, the ability for people to align their resources to various types of standards. Yeah, um, we are, um, we support people trying to categorize things in a way that they need to, but being transparent and sharing it. So we have built dozens of evaluation and alignment tools for people. Most cases, we can then take them and share them in OER Commons for everybody. Some cases we can't because they're specific. So, for example, we've built a, a, an, um, an alignment tool for Common Core. We've built a tool for next generation science standards. We've done state standards. We've done the Achieve uh, OER evaluation rubric. There's Equip. Um, so, we just say, let's, let's in fact, you know, if every state wants their own standards or their own common core influence standard, let them do that. And as long as we do a good cross map of it, you know, wouldn't that be interesting to really see over time how different are the standards have, as how you're adopting them from one state to the next? Like this is actually could be an incredible uh, research base to really answer these questions in practice as opposed to just, well, in theory, those won't, those won't suffice for me. So we build those kinds of tools into OER Commons. Um, often we build them because uh, like a foundation has said, um, like uh, I think Hewlett funded Achieve to have us build their Achieve uh, rubric into OER Commons. Um, but in some cases, um, 
you know, some uh, we had somebody who wanted us to build this for for uh, next gen science standards, and as part of our agreements when we build this, even if we build it for their own microsite or hub, we say, well, we then what we build needs to go back into the commons. So we really take seriously this idea about. Um, making things open and freely available and so anything we build in, in 90 you know 5% of the cases we put right back into the public commons so that anybody can benefit them and that's really kind of how we we've built this base over time um, and then in the interest of time I do want I don't want you to miss your flight <laughs> don't worry I'm fine I'm fine Let, let's uh, this is probably a good question to uh, conclude when it in, in the spirit of our conversations uh, of impact and and coming together to work on a common um, common cause so Anthony asked this question a long time ago and sorry Anthony we were just getting into it now but we kind of moved off this idea of um, your pursuing your vision but um, so how do you draw how did you draw others to your vision and he's interested in how you motivate motivated them to invest their money in your vision of serving others I think that's that's probably a great question to, to kind of wrap with so this is specifically really around the funding is that what you're you know sort of how yeah, yeah. yeah. so question. Yeah. yeah well you know it's interesting because um, some people sort of promote open education resources for this for the sake of OER like OER is important, free and open is important, open source is important, just do it, right? And I find that that may be very helpful for sort of the open kind of evangelist type of people, but in fact we see OER much more as what is a problem you're trying to solve and does OER help you get there? So we don't really see it as a, a, an end to itself, but really as a means to create the kind of transformation or change that you're trying to make. And in that case, it's really not trying to convince people. I think early on in the OER movement, there was a lot of kind of flag waving, like you must do this because it's morally right. You know, I don't, I don't think in the end of the day that really, it, it convinces a very small group of people. I think really the issue is, we need in our state to, okay, in present week included, but we, we need in our state to have common core aligned math materials. Um, how can OER help us? Well, we have these whole collections of, of free and open materials that other people have already aligned to Common Core. These can help you. Great. How do I use it? How do I train my teachers how to use it, right? So it isn't so much of convincing people to do it, but to really understand what is the problem and the issues that they're trying to solve. And, uh, and, and when you have an open and transparent kind of context like that, um, then it becomes... Um, if you're filling a need, you're not trying to create a demand. Yeah, that's, we're kind of noticing that within our work is that the more you tell the story of the need, in fact, at, uh, Open Ed 16, that was one of our sessions, was it was kind of billed as a needs analysis. And uh, it, it once you share the stories and uh, of, of where the need is, it, it is more compelling <laughs> rather than just, here's my solution without giving the, uh, the reason why it's needed. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much and coming in on not only a Saturday but on a travel day because those are no fun <laughs> and international travel as well and as I mentioned at the start of this so thank you so much for your support of our organization and the work we're doing and thank you for letting us use your tools for free. <laughs> That's been great. You are so welcome and thank you for the work that you do. Um, I, again it's it's working as a community you know it's 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 intersecting with all these other communities of practice that actually make the work we do so worthwhile and um, uh, that's why I get up every day. So um, thank you very much. And I've enjoyed being here. And I'm sorry I won't be able to participate later in the day. I might call in later if I'm sitting in, sitting at the airport with a delay. But um, <laughs> just great work you're that's doing. Great. And thank you so much. And I'm glad that also these are being taped so we can go listen to them later. Yeah, so that's another nerve-wracking thing. I keep checking throughout that I'm still recording. And I am. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Lisa. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so I can...